every man, woman, and child deserves to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know 42% of the world is still waiting to hear that Jesus loves them? Billions are still unreached, living without access to a church, to scripture, or to anyone who can tell them. And less than 1% of the church resources are being used to reach them. The unequal distribution of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest injustice facing the church today. It has been said that nothing is more dangerous than sincere ignorance. And this is true when it comes to our global missions efforts. 70% of Christians are unaware that there are still people who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Millions live in villages, towns, cities that do not have a single church or a single missionary telling them about Jesus. In fact, 2,000 language groups still do not have a single scripture translated into their own language. And yet, sadly, in America, we spend more on costumes, on our pets, than we do to reach those who have never had a chance to hear. The current imbalance of our resources makes the challenge of reaching the lost seem impossible. But we know it is inevitable. Revelation 7-9 gives us a vision of a multitude so great that it cannot be counted from every tribe, every tongue, every nation standing before the throne and worshipping the one who gave us everything. So with 42% still waiting to hear, what can you do? What can you give? If Jesus gave his life for them, shouldn't we as well? Good morning, church. It's so good to worship with you again. Let's stand on our feet this morning and sing a song of praise, a song of hope, encouragement, faith, and joy to the Lord today. He is worthy of, of all that we are. So let's sing our songs in response to him today. Come on. I was lost, and he found me. I was sick, and he healed me. I was dead, and he raised me up again. I was bound, and he freed me. Now I stand in his victory. 
service today. We got some great special guests joining us this morning. But if it's your first time today, I'm so glad to have you here in this place with us, joining us for service, worshiping the Lord. If it is your first time joining us today, I want you to do something before me before you leave these doors, and that's fill out one of our Connect cards. It's in the back of your bulletin or in the seat back pocket in front of you. Fill that connect card out and get connected with us. We, just, we want to know a little bit about you, give you a chance to know a little bit about us. Also, ways that we could be praying for you, ways for you to get involved here. There's so many cool things about that connect card, all right? So fill that connect card out this morning and then put it in the offering bucket as that comes around this morning or head on over to that welcome center right behind us here, right behind the sanctuary. Give that to the person behind the counter and they'll give you a gift for being a first-time guest. But if it's not your first time, today's the day. Fill that connect card out. Don't delay anymore, okay? Get that, get that gift from the Welcome Center. And if you're on that side of the screen, head on over to riveroflifeag.org slash card. Connect with us that way. And we'd love to connect with you in any way that we can as well. Like I said, without further ado, great service today. Just turn to your neighbor and wish him a happy morning. Tell me you're excited to see him.
I've just been reading through Mark 15 these past couple of days, and I've been challenged, Mark 5, by this, by this one thing that they kept saying. It said that people came to him, and they begged him earnestly for their miracles. They begged him earnestly. And that just struck me, because it says the demons also begged him earnestly to be cast out and cast into pigs. And that challenged me, because when I come before the Lord, Sometimes it's just a list of things. I got to take care of this prayer and this person and this, you know. But how often do I come before him and beg him earnestly, Lord, I need you to move in my life. Because oftentimes what happens is the only time that we ever do that is when things change and they flip and before we even know it, our life is upside down. Then we beg earnestly. But if the demons can beg earnestly, what's my excuse? Right? And so I think, God, I want you to move in my life. I want to see miracles, and I want to see the hand of God evident in my life. But then I go on as if I never prayed that. That convicted me this week. And I wanted to share that with you, not to try and and guilt trip or shame or anything like that, but just maybe just to present something to you. God is a God who loves and it often says in, in, in the Gospels that Jesus was, was, he was affected by compassion, and that's what led him to heal. When he would go off and, and, and pray by himself, oftentimes he was interrupted by that, but because he had compassion, he would minister. Lord, I beg of you earnestly to move in my life. I beg of you earnestly to move in this church. Father, so many of us come before you just with such timidity. Yes, Lord, we are to have a healthy fear for you. But it also says in your word to come boldly before the throne of God and to cast all of our cares before you because you care. So, Lord, teach us to live lives that continue to to, to see what that means to beg earnestly, Lord. To not just put our, 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 our issues or our wants or our needs or things that we know that we need to present before you as secondary, Lord. We need to come before you and cast all of our cares upon you because you care. Because another miracle is on the way. You're preparing something. And whether or not we can sense that, Lord, you are preparing something. So, Father, continue to move in this service today. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. We bless you, Lord.
just thank you for your word. That we can cast our cares upon you and you care. Lord, that you know us by name. Father, today is a day that we can rejoice and we can sing and we can remember. And once again, Lord, I think of your word, Psalm 91. That when we call upon your name, you answer. When we call upon your name, you answer. Lord, we just thank you for the miracles. We thank you for the, for the ways that you're responding to us. We thank you for the miracle of our salvation. Lord, that today we can be here because simply your love. So, Father, continue to have your way in this place and lead us to where your spirit is directing us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What an incredible time of worship. Thank you guys so much for being here. If you are new with us, make sure to fill out that Connect card. Bring it back to the... Uh, welcome Center. We have a free gift for you, and we just want to get connected with you and let you know maybe what a next step in your life is or how you can get connected. And a great next step is our Inlet Dinner. It's a great way to connect with our staff, get to know who we are, ask questions of any kind, and just have a lunch or a dinner at Denny and Cheryl's house, and it is just an incredible time of just connecting together. So we invite you to that. That is on March 24th. And then on March 22nd and 23rd, which is this Friday and Saturday, we have Men's Advance, and we have a good crew of guys going up there. And it's just a great time to worship God together. There's going to be over 1,200 men just worshiping and praising God. So if you want to just drive up and be a part of it, ask me for more information, or it's on our website or our bulletin. Get that, and uh, we would love for you to be a part of that. And then lastly, we have our Easter weekend, so we have a good Friday service. That is going to be the same as our two Sunday services, but we would love for you to be a part of one of those three services. And then we have our Easter egg hunt on Saturday, and it's just a great time for our kids just to have a blast and eat some candy and, and just have a time together. Uh, but now as we jump into a time of offering, our ushers can come forward. The ways that you can give are going to be on the screen behind me. But we just want to highlight and celebrate what God has done this past year. Over the past year, in 2023, we gave over $500,000 for missions. Yeah, that's, that's uh, incredible. Thank you for being a part of that. We, we truly appreciate all that you guys do to be a part of the Great Commission. I hope everybody got one of these bullet or booklets. It just kind of shares some of the amazing things that God has done through our church. It shows our missionaries, the organi organizations we support. Uh, but on the second to last page, there's three QR codes that look like this. And we want everyone to be a part of the Great Commission in some way. We want you praying for our missionaries, for the unreached people groups. We want you giving to missions and being a part of sending missionaries and supporting the organizations. And then we also want you guys going on trips yourselves. Uh, in that last QR code, it will get you connected with a page. That way, anytime we have upcoming trips, we can keep you guys up to date on what trips we have going on. And it, within the next week or two, we'll send out our trips for 2025. And we would love for you to go on one of those trips. If you've never been on a trip, I think it would be an incredible opportunity for you. But thank you for an incredible year. Thank you for giving. And thank you for being a part of the Great Commission in reaching central Minnesota and the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for continuing to use us as a vessel to reach the world. And I just pray for your hands on 2024. We pray that you just continue to use us as a church. Bless our missionaries. Bless our organizations that we support. And we just pray for a, your hand on everything we do and every dollar given today. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you for your giving this morning. We have a, a real treat. You've been with us throughout the month of March and part of February on this mission experience we've been uh, going through. And today we have, I think, a real treat uh, from down in Mississippi, uh, someone I got to know at a Speed of Light event out in North Carolina. He, uh, he's got a passion to win people for Christ. He does a lot of work with uh, domestic human trafficking. Him and Wendy have been doing this for 12 years. It's part of Free International. Free International has been around since 2009. Their base is in Las Vegas, Nevada. Jody and Wendy are based in Jackson, Mississippi, and they come here uh, to share a little bit what God's doing through their ministry and through your giving, because the truck you see out there, you'll be able to tour 
After the service, we'd like to go out and tour that truck. Um, we'd love to have you do it just to see what you helped purchase in doing that. I, was, I like Jody also because of the things he likes. He likes his grandkids. He likes to fish. He likes to hunt. He likes old cars. And uh, that's pretty, pretty interesting. You'll hear a little, bit about it, a little more about it this morning. But would you welcome with me this morning Jody Dice, Jackson, Mississippi. If you notice, he runs past me as I come on stage because uh, he knows I'm going to give him this big bear hug. So he, he flees. <laughs> it is such an honor to be back with you guys today. And uh, we, are, we love River of Life. We love coming up here and seeing you guys. Uh, my wife, Wendy, sends her regards. She wished she could be here. Uh, I actually flew from Pensacola, Florida here. 92, sunny. Pastor Denny, is there snow on the ground? No, it's nice up there. And then this morning. I think that's going to be a little extra, but we'll worry about that later. But it is an honor to be here. My wife, though, she does send her love. And uh, uh, the last time I was here, it was pre-COVID. So a lot of things changed. We were in a, in a sanctuary over that way, I guess it is, yeah, on the other side. And man, look what God's done. Look what you have now. And uh, it's so much an honor and a blessing to see what's happening. And I believe you're in this place because of your heart for missions and your pastor's heart for missions and his staff. And God just continues to bless this place because of that. And we love you guys so much. And so I just thought since Wendy couldn't be here with me, I would bring my whole family and show them to you. And so this is my deal right here. This is my group. This is my, uh, my little tribe. On the right, you see my daughter and son-in-law, Micah, and our four grandkids by them. Asher's the oldest. Silas with the glasses is the second one. Naomi, the princess. She makes no bones about it, that she is the princess of the house. Uh, in fact, uh, that's what she said. Gee, are you going to bring me back a unicorn? I was like, yeah, baby. Do you know running sells unicorns? Because I sure bought one. <laughs> and then my little dude that's up there, that's Jojo. He's named after me. Both of our names are Joseph, and uh, uh, he lives with me. And something happened on that trip, uh, the last trip, that while we were here, that time when we brought the truck, for those of you that remember that, we were here this Sunday. The following Sunday, we were over in Stillwater. And then during the next week, we traveled all the way across uh, northern Wisconsin, across uh, the upper UP, and down into Michigan to Saginaw, and then on down to Grand Rapids for their youth convention. So we were a little over three weeks on the road coming home. And at the church that I attend to is actually, at that time, its name was River of Life as well, all right? It's uh, even almost the same logo. And I got there, and the pastor's like, hey, we did something. Uh, you're, I know you're my, one of my mentors because I used to be his youth pastor when he was a kid. And so it was really cool to have him in there. And he said, I know I normally come to you for advice, but I really didn't feel like I would get non-biased advice on this. I was like, what? He said, we were needing an executive pastor and worship pastor, and we made a hire. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's good, man. You don't have to run that kind of stuff by me. You know, we're just kind of more of accountability stuff. He said, well, we hired Mike and Alicia. They're moving over here from Meridian, which is on the other side of the state of Mississippi. I said, so you're telling me my grandkids are moving over here by me? And he's like, yeah. I said, you're exactly right. You would have got a very biased opinion on that. That's definitely from heaven, you know? <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, best things that's ever happened to me was joining the grandparent club. Who all in here is grandparents? It's a good club, isn't it? Uh, I said in the first service, my dad told me, and I always thought, dude, that's, dad, that's the rudest thing you ever said. He said, man, if I'd known grandbabies was so good, I'd have skipped you and your brother. Okay, dad. <laughs> I love you, too. I'm putting you in a home when you get old. <laughs> And then our youngest daughter in the hat, Emily, she's still our work in progress. God is doing some good things in her life, but we're still in the progress of working alone. And, and so uh, how many of you were here last night for the missions banquet and stuff? Uh, you, you came here. Man, thank you all so much for being a part of that. 
uh, your church does it right. Your church staff, your pastor, y'all do it right when it comes to missions. And I had a blast last night. So for some of y'all that heard that, uh, Pastor Denny was making fun of the way I talk. All right? I don't talk funny. I'm just from a little south of here, not too far. And then my mom's family's from even way further south than that. They're from way down to Bayou Desha in South Louisiana. They're okay. You see, see more? So that's how it is down, way down the Bayou. And so uh, we were talking last night about it. And uh, whenever I go home, they call me the Kuyon Redneck. That's what they call me when I go back down to where my mom's family's from because Kuyon means crazy guy. In Cajun French, if you don't get that, I'm the crazy guy. You'll figure that out by the end of this sermon if you haven't figured it out yet. And then the redneck, just because that's what they call us in Mississippi for some reason. I don't know. We wear shoes. It's okay. We've graduated. Some of us can even read. <laughs> but uh, it's such an honor. It, yeah, just kind of a, kind of reminds me of a story that I heard back home one time, uh, way down to Bayou there. If you go to, in, in South Louisiana, there's only three directions. Up here, you have north, south, east, and west, right? Well, if you go down to South Louisiana, if you ever go down, like, where Swamp People's film. I don't need subtitles because my family goes down there and, and I know everything they say there because I talk flat like them when I go down there. And so it, my wife, she's like, you, me, you go. No, I don't understand a word you say there, boy. You know, it's a, but uh, we were down there and there was this church, this little bitty church, and it was way down the bayou. And the only directions in the bayou is either up the bayou, down the bayou, across the bayou. A bayou is not swamp. It's a channel or a canal. And so where, you, like I said, you have north, south, east, and west. You either go up the bayou, you go down the bayou, or go across the bayou. And it depends on which side of the bayou you're on is it determines which way if you're going across the bayou. So that's there you go. If you're ever down in South Louisiana, you hear someone say that to you, yeah, just go down the bayou and then you'll find it. There you, you got your directions. But there was a church and it was way down towards the end of the bayou. A little old country Cajun church out in the middle of nowhere. It actually had a canal that went on one side of it and the road on the other side. So you could go to church by boat, P-Row, or car. And this particular Sunday morning, man, the church was packed. Man, people had been coming from all over. They was in there. They were packed in there. The windows were open. And they were waiting for the preacher to show up and preach. You know, there's traveling preachers that travel down to Bayou there in their boats. And, and he never showed. And so they all just sitting there saying, where the preacher at? And about that time, the devil appeared in the pulpit. Man, people started screaming like you ain't never heard. People bailing out the windows of the church. People running for the back door, and it just log jammed. They couldn't get through. I mean, it's just chaos. People were scared for their lives because Satan himself had showed up. Except this one man sitting in the front pew. He just sat there, arms folded, stomped, and never budged. The devil looked at him, and he said, Boudreaux, you ain't scared of me. Boudreaux said, I've been married to your twin sister for 45 years. Why would I be scared of you? <laughs> so I pray that uh, your marriages are better than Boudreaux's. <laughs> but we're here today, and as we talk about missions, I love, I love the opportunity to share what we do. I love the calling that God's called us into, even though I didn't want to do it. I came into it kicking and screaming, not wanting to, to be honest with you. And... Uh, through it, I've learned many, many lessons. There's things that apply in the world of human trafficking that doesn't apply in pastoral ministry or it doesn't apply in others. The love for the soul, the love for the lost is always going to be there. But you know, if you were here the last time I preached, I talked about how important one is, how big that number really is. And we've learned that more and more over the last several years since we've been here with you guys. And so today, uh, we're going to be going into Matthew chapter 16, 26, and just to kind of set the stage of what was going there, this is where Jesus is getting ready. He's getting time uh, to come into the, what we now celebrate as the Easter season, the Passover. And while he's there, him and Peter kind of step aside, and he just asked Peter the question, hey, what do people, who do people say that I am? And, you know, People start naming out all these things, and then Peter, uh, Jesus asked Peter, said, who do you say that I am? He says, you're the Messiah, and, and, and Jesus just opens up his eyes, and he says, the only reason you know that is because the Father has revealed that to you. 
And then as he continues to do this and he starts to, to go ahead and, and kind of predict his death and his resurrection, he kind of starts putting the basis of why what's about to happen is, is going down. He does, he's already kind of trying to explain to them that I've got to die. I've got to give my life, but I will rise again. And they're still not kind of getting it. And so he kind of breaks it down to, to purposes. And in, in Matthew 16, 26, it kind of states a very strong purpose for that. And it's, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus is trying to kind of, I feel like, trying to establish something in the disciples' hearts, and especially Peter, about we put value on things. We put value on things in our lives, in our belongings, people that we're around. We have those people in our life, right, that whenever you see them coming down the road or you meet them in the grocery store and you're like, oh, Lord, here comes another hour and a half conversation. We actually start putting value on what kind of conversations we're going to have with this person. Or the person that, oh man, I just, I, I don't have time for that. Or we put value on them that you just want to be around them so much, even though they're not blood relatives. You just, you have a value that you love and you embrace these people. But then we have many things that are invaluable to us, right? You've got something at your house that maybe it was an heirloom, something that's been passed down that there's no amount of money could buy that from you, right? I have one of those things. My dad gave me my granddad's double barrel shotgun. Now, the thing about this shotgun is uh, my granddad died six months before my mom and dad got married, so I never got to meet my granddad. I have no idea what his voice sounded like. I have no idea of his demeanor or anything about the way he, he moved or talked. But I do know he was an avid outdoorsman. He loved to quail hunt and rabbit and squirrel hunt, and this was his favorite gun. Now, let me tell you, it's not a prized gun if you looked at it. It doesn't have fancy inlays or, or the stock and the forearms are all nice and fancy. Think of a poor southern cotton farmer's shotgun. The bluings wore off, the forearms plain and, and cracked, the, the butt is, is worn and faded, and it's just, it's just not like a super appealing gun, but it's, it's my favorite gun in my safe. You shoot the gun, it's fun to shoot. I've killed pheasants with it. I've killed quail with it. To me, it kind of gives me that opportunity. I just get this feeling I'm hunting with my granddad when I take this old gun out. It kicks. Oh, it kicks. We say down south, it kicks like a mule and it'll stomp a mud hole in you. That's how hard that gun kicks. And, but it is fun to shoot. But there is not a person in this room could offer me enough money for that gun because that was my granddad's right? I've put value on it because of what it means. Jesus is explaining to the disciples here, I've put value in souls. And there's no amount of thing that you can trade, buy, or give that's worth your soul. People do it every day. They'll live the way they want to for 80 years and throw away an eternity because they've got their life the way they want it right now. And they have no regard for what eternity says. I've got this, this bad habit that just kind of started about seven years ago. I've always loved hot rods. As Pastor Denny alluded to it, I love anything that has horsepower. I love to see burnouts and tire smoke. I like to hear straight headers and big blocks. I like a cam that lopes. And uh, I used to run all the games at the Mississippi Assembly of God campground. And our campground was called Indian Springs in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. How I many of y'all ever been to Kosciuszko, Mississippi? I didn't think so. We have to actually pipe in sunlight to this place. It's the biggest town nearest where our campground used to be. The actual address to the campground was Indian Springs, Box 36, Route 62, Possum Neck, Mississippi. I ain't lying. You don't believe me? Go ask Groovy in the trailer. He's bigger than me, and he'll, he'll testify to it. There's a place. I actually kind of like Possum Neck myself. You know, that's, I would have called it Possum Neck Assembly of God Campground, but it didn't go over so well at the district council. <laughs> People think we stupid we do that. <laughs> but anyway, 
I was up there, it was on a Sunday, camps were getting ready to start, and I'm, me and my interns were laying out the field getting ready for, for summer games that, that year, and we're getting all the stuff laid out in this huge, big event field, and all of a sudden I hear this loud motor crank up, and it's echoing through the hollers of, of Possum Neck, Mississippi, just boom, 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 boom. I could tell it was a big block. Oh, my old heart started going, chicoon, chicoon, chicoon. And I could tell it's getting closer to me, driving down through them old dirt roads, coming up to the campground. And I'm like, oh, I got to see what this is. I don't know what it is, but it's going to be bad, man. It's going to be tough. I got to see this thing. And all of a sudden, the ugliest thing I ever saw in my life appeared coming over the hill. It was an old 35 Chevrolet cab, black, rusted out with a bed that had all kinds of junk on it, big motor with a blower out the top, big tires on the back, skinny tires on the front. It was a rat rod. Never seen one, never heard of one. First time I ever saw one. And I fell in love with that ugly thing. <laughs> I was like, I want one of the, I want to build one of these. I don't want to just buy one. I want to build one. And so my ambition was is I just wanted something that I could just melt tires off of it. That's all I wanted. And lo and behold, I come back and about a year or two later, my cousin lives just outside Starkville where Mississippi State's at, and he calls me and he says, hey man, did you, you still want to build that rat rod? And I'm like, yeah man, I, I want one. He said, I got something for you. Come get it out of my yard. It's, it's just scrap metal. It's junk. It ain't worth nothing. If you can use it to build a rat rod, you can have it. If not, just sell it for scrap metal. It might be worth $200. So I take off, man. He, I go up to his house with my trailer and my, my binders and chains and straps, and I take my buddy with me, and we pull up in his yard, and this is what he has out there for me when I pull up. 48 Ford F1, just the cab on the frame. Now, is there any other parts of this thing anywhere? I'm excited because I see something that's not there. I see that old black rat rod coming up in the hood out in that field with that big motor rumbling, and, and he just saw scrap metal. That's the value he had put in this was it's just junk. We begin to walk around the farm. We find the doors that went to it. They were hid in some old shed. We finally found the bed and three pieces in another old shed. No hood, no fenders, no front grill, nothing. That's all we had. That's all I need. <laughs> We were walking back to the, to the, uh, the truck with, with what we had found, and I looked behind this old little smokehouse thing, and there's something that caught my eye. I could see chrome on it. It was black, and it was the roof to a chicken coop. And I walk over there, and it's the hood to this truck. The old man that uh, uh, had this stuff had built a roof for his chicken coop out of the hood of this truck and brush painted it black. I said, I got to have it. Let's get it. So we took it. I go home, man, I'm the happiest camper in the world, beep bopping down the Natchez Trace with this thing on the back of my trailer, strapped down. I pull up at my house, now let me explain something. My wife is a motorhead. She loves cars, but she likes nice, shiny, fast cars like 69 Camaros and, and 70 Chevelles. She likes muscle cars. I pull up with all this on the back of the trailer, and she looks at me, and she says, what, we starting a junkyard? We Sanford and Son now? What's going on? <laughs> I'm like, baby, you got to see it. This is going to, remember that truck that was at the campground? She says, yeah, the ugly one. I said, yeah, that one. I'm going to build me one of them. She's like, that's all we need, just more junk in the yard. The neighbors are already thinking we're crazy. Now they really think we're crazy, you know. She didn't see what I saw. I saw something that I wanted. I saw something that I could build. And as we begin to go into this, the process of building this old truck was a, it had some value to me because I could see something that it could become. And as we look through the scriptures here of, of Matthew, and I, and I want to talk you through just a few points that I feel like, I feel like Jesus was trying to say some things because he sees value in us when we don't see it in ourselves. He sees value in the people that we think are just garbage. Like a woman caught in adultery and brought out to be stoned. He saw value in her. Like a woman at a well that, refused, that would only come in the heat of the day because she had already had five husbands and the man she was with wasn't her husband at the time. He saw value in her. And so as he's looking at Peter and he's saying these things, I think the very first thing he was trying to tell him is, don't you understand the value of a soul is measured by the source from which it came, man? Me and my Father and the Holy Spirit, we created man 
And I'm willing to give my life for all mankind. There's a value to that, that I'm willing to lay down my life. It's really hard to go out onto the streets and try to help a girl that is caught in human trafficking in the world of prostitution. They run from me more than they run to me. They're scared. They're addicted. They're just, some of them just flat out mean. And they don't see the hand of love that's being reached to them. They'll slap it away because all they've known is the only value they have is what their body could get them because that's what they've been trained up to do. But God has given us a love, and I hope he gives you that same kind of love that this is a creation that he created. He created and gave his son so that each one of these could have eternal life. The second thing you see through this is the value of a soul is measured by its eternal quality. If he is going to die for your soul, if he's going to die for you, the reason he does that is because the moment you were born, you were born for eternity. You may say, well, life comes and life ends, but the moment you draw your first breath, eternity begins for you here on earth and then from there on out. And so if there's an eternal quality to this, then how much more should a soul be saved and looked for? The third value of this, as you need to know, is that the devil is super interested in it. If he's not interested in it, why would he be trying to steal it? Right? Jesus says that he has come to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come to give life and life more abundantly. So if that's the case, there's great value if someone wants to steal what the enemy, uh, what God has created. The fourth thing to know is this. The value of a soul is measured by God's concern for saving it. It impresses me about how passionate God is for souls every time I walk out onto the streets. Because there's days I'm not that, very, that compassionate. I just have to be honest with you. The type of people that you're meeting, the guys that, and I know, I know Jesus died for the guys that are buying kids and selling kids. But there's something about being able to grasp that understanding and knowing that God has put this type of value in there that he wants to save them. And when he does that to you, you get attached to the cases. You grow into them. Summer, July 2022, the World Games, which is like a version of the Olympics, was in Birmingham, Alabama. Alabama Homeland Security, Alabama State Police, they all reached out to our teams and said, hey, we need y'all to come in we have 17, possibly 19 confirmed seasick juveniles that, were, that Intel tells us is going to be here in the Birmingham area and being exploited. Odds are there was way more than that, but these are the ones that they had solid Intel on, and nine of those were from Alabama itself. CSEC stands for Commercially Exploited uh, Kids, so CSEC, Confirmed Sexually Exploited Children. And... Uh, we go over there, and I don't know why my team always gets assigned the, the hard cases, but that just kind of seems how it goes. Maybe it, Jeremy is the hunter in me, and I enjoy the hunt a little bit. You know, we're, we love the dig. Sometimes I would like the easy finds, and everything goes great, but they assigned a girl's t case to me. Her name's Cassie. Cassie's 16 years old. Her mom has been sent off uh, court-ordered to a drug rehabilitation center, has no idea who her daddy is. Her uncle is a... Uh, alcoholic Vietnam vet that is the only one that seems to have any concern for her life but she has no place to go and even the state had had put a no contact order between her and her mom and she starts bed hopping because she has nowhere to go no school to go to no re nothing register she's been put into homes abused in homes and then kicked out permanent shelters that failed and that's the kid they give me 
For a full week, we traveled all over the state of Alabama looking for this kid or the greater area of Birmingham on up to Gadsden and, and these areas. And it seemed like every time we would get close to Cassie, it started out, we're like 14 days behind her. You go in there and people say, yeah, she was here 14 days ago or she was here 10 days ago. Every day, and we're only there for a week, but we, it just seemed like we were slowly getting closer and closer. We were interviewing people. We were running and scrubbing social media. We were using facial recognition software uh, from hotels and stuff. We would get their images and run, run pics. And on Saturday evening, we were within 45 minutes of Cassie. Went into a little bingo hall and the people said, yes, yeah, she was just here 45 minutes ago. She just left. And I'm like, we're, we're going to get her. It's getting close. It reminds me of the old hunting shows that at the last hour or the last day, you finally had that big buck walk out. I feel like that's what's about to happen. One o'clock Sunday morning, just after midnight, we sealed our cases. We could never get any closer to Cassie. So I lay down in my trailer out here. If you go in it, there's a big queen-size bed up in the front. My wife's already in there. She'd been running comms all day. You'll see the radios and all in there. I go up and I crawl up into the bed, and I lay there, and I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated that this kid can't see the help that because she had run into our numbers. She had run into her flyers and she was kind of actually running from us because she didn't know that we were sincere and genuinely trying to help her. Because she had heard, oh, I'll give you a better life. You'll get all these great things. But there was a catch to every one of those. She had to do things that she knew was wrong and she didn't want to have to do, but that was what was required of her. The fifth point is our redemption, right? The, the, the value of a soul is measured by the price that's paid for it. I got to thinking about if Jesus was willing to walk up and pay for a soul with his life, how much harder should I be digging for Cassie? It's a sea of faces. We found well over now 700 uh, women, boys, and girls nationwide, but they're just those few that stick out to you, right? You got emotionally attached to them. Maybe you get spiritually attached to them. And I realized that I wasn't done with Cassie, and I'm laying in that bed thinking about her in the front of that room, and I'm just praying. I'm like, Lord, you know where she's at right now. You see exactly what's going on through there. If it's not going to be me, at least let her find somebody that she can go up to and just say, I need help from today. Finally, I go to sleep. It feels like I just closed my eyes and there's beating on my door and I open the door. It's right at 6 a.m. Open the door and it's our, our ops chief. And he's like, hey, Cassie just called the hotline number. She wants to meet with you at Burger King. And they gave me the address and it was like 20 minutes from me. Man, I jump up, I grab my team, we jump in our Yukon, and man, we take off as fast as we can to this northern Birmingham area that she was at. I walk into the Burger King, and there's no kid around. And we're all just kind of standing there, and we just sit down, and all of a sudden, this, this girl that didn't even look, she didn't look like our missing kid flyers. In fact, she could have walked past me 20 times, and I wouldn't have recognized her because of what the life on the streets had done to her. She come in and she looked at me and she said, are, are you one of the shepherds? And I was like, I am. She said, my name's Cassie. And she said, am I going to jail? I'm like, no, baby, you're not going to jail. We're here to help you. And you don't have to do nothing for us. And I asked her, I said, I said, sweetheart, are you hungry? She said, yeah, I haven't eaten in several days. So we bought her a breakfast and um I backed out of showing you that video today because I secretly videoed her eating. And I mean, she's grabbing pancakes by the handful, balling it up and shoving it in her mouth because she's starving to death because this is the way they had worked her and ran her so hard. We get her the help. She gets placed in a little better placement that will help her with getting all of her, her past 
expunged and her mom had just graduated this faith-based drug rehab program and her mom was saved as well now and so we got the no contact order dropped where she could go back home to mom to this apartment complex that the shelter was furnishing as transition and they would accept Cassie to live there me and Cassie exchanged text messages several times on my burn phone my work phone that we use and uh, but her mom would stay in more contact with me. Christmas comes around, and some of our special kids like this. I told one last night about one of my girls, and I send gifts to them. You know, my wife and I send care packages to them. And uh, my wife and I sent Cassie this whole big makeup kit from uh, wherever my daughters that do makeup ordered theirs from, and so we sent one to Cassie as well. And that was the last contact I had with them. I hadn't heard nothing else out of them. Fast forward to June this past year, I was in Oneonta, Alabama, working at the Alabama kids camp. My grandkids had went to camp there, and I get to go as a granddad, in, as a granddad sponsor. So I was the cool counselor at camp because I smuggled food into the cabin, you know. <laughs> I have all the sour gummy worms. <laughs> Tuesday, we're sitting there, and uh, my phone rings, and I look, and it's Cassie's mom. And so I step outside of the cafeteria, and I, I answer the phone, and I ask her how she's doing, and she says, I've been dreading. I didn't know how to make this phone call. That's how she put it. I didn't know how to make this phone call. And so I knew what was about to come out because it happens so many times. You find a kid, you start helping them, and then they hit the doors, and they run. I actually have kids that I, and girls that I've had to find six and seven times because they ran out. And Cassie, I was afraid, was doing that. And um, I wish that's what had happened. Her mom said uh, just a few weeks ago, Cassie was murdered by her former pimp. She had went with her boyfriend to Alabama, uh, to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. He had followed them down there, and just unbeknownst to them, her boyfriend got jammed up on some charges because it was his third driving with a suspended license, and she's now without a ride and stuff, and guess who comes to the rescue? The guy that's always exploited her. And so he's like, hey, I can get him out. I'll pay all the charges off, but tonight you got to go to love's truck stop and we're going to make you you need to gave her a quote of how many men that she had to be with that night and cassie listened to one thing that i said that i don't know if she heard anything else but she heard this one thing i said cassie your value is way more than what your body presents You're a child of the king. You're more valuable than anything that any man can take from you or use you for. You never have to do this again. And she believed that. And she stood her ground that night. She said, no, I'm not going to let you sell me again. I've walked away from that. I'm worth more than that. Her mom said that the beating lasted for they estimate for close to six hours off and on. And he beat this kid to death. She sent me pictures, well, showed me pictures of, of Cassie in the ICU unit. I got attached to this kid. I love them all, but I got attached to this kid. I already had her funeral. They buried her in a pauper's grave in Oneonta, Alabama. And I was like, that's where I'm at right now. I said, Let's meet up. And her mom came into town, and I went and met her mom at a little restaurant and bought her lunch. I said, take me to Cassie's grave. Because if I could have done anything, I could have at least preached her funeral. I don't know what else to do. Help you, Mom. But, I mean, what else can I do for Cassie? We walk out in this little church cemetery, and they buried her way off in the corner because she's been buried in a pauper's grave because Mom had no money buried in a wicker casket because she couldn't do anything else. And I walk out there and it's just a pile of dirt, a couple of long stem carnations 
dying or withered up on top of it that they threw down, just her and her sister, and a little plastic marker with Cassie's name on it. I felt like I had lost that day. Because I saw something that could have been so beautiful and so successful in life, and I'm standing at a pauper's grave. So I did the only thing that I knew how to do. I didn't have the money for it. But I said, come on, we're going, we're going to find a monument shop here in, in Aniana. And we went down the monument shop, and I said, you pick out whatever you want. If I have to take out a second mortgage, I'll do it. But we're going to buy this kid a headstone. She's going to have some honor, and she's going to have some respect in some form of fashion. And we bought her a headstone, and her mom made a weird request. She said, I, uh, if you'll do it, I'll work double shifts just to pay you back, but I'd like to get a footstone with the nickname I gave her when she was a baby. And I said, okay, that's sure. And so we bought a footstone that said stink butt. Apparently she had really bad diapers. I don't know. Because <laughs> I love babies. <laughs> Just like you. <laughs> and uh, that was the best I could do for Cassie that day. We still work with mom. We're still trying to help mom. But Cassie knew what her value was in the eyes of God that day. If anything, she heard it that day. And I went back to my house, and I went out into my shop, and I sat down as I did so many times looking at this old truck. And I'd work a little here on it and a little there on it. But after I got back from that camp last summer, I remember sitting out there just beating on the hood of it. I was angry that we didn't do more for Cassie. And I was angry at God, I'm just going to be honest with you, that we had done all that work, why couldn't she have lived to tell her story or something? Help others, whatever. I don't know. I, 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 I can't answer that. And one day I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to see her. I truly believe I'm going to see her there. Because she gave her heart to God that day, one of those days that we were meeting. And as I was sitting in my shop, that thing that I saw that looked like junk, Right? My wife was laughing at, after seven years of therapy work, that's what it was, turned into this weird looking thing that I drive almost every day now. I love rat rods. I even left the hood painted black from the chicken coop. <laughs> I am G Diddy, by the way. <laughs> Best title I've ever had. And God said, this is your potter's house. You saw something that had no value and you created something out of it that meant something to you just as the same way I see these girls and these boys on the streets. Everyone else sees them as garbage, prostitutes, throwaway, whatever you want to label them. But I see them for what I created them to be. I'm sad that I've kind of finished the old truck because it was good therapy. Now the therapy's driving it with my grandson beside me saying, gee, do a burnout. All right, buddy. Tires are getting expensive, but here we go. <laughs> Today, as we are wrapping up this great missions initiative week, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we begin to wrap this out. And I know we've been here probably longer than you used to. But I really felt like I, you needed to hear my heart. Your students sacrificed. The last time I was here, there was a young lady that was getting up in the wee hours of the morning and feeding calves and, and selling them to give to speed the light. And y'all give so much to BGMC that helps us. If you go out there, there's night vision in my vehicle, there's computers, there's drones, all that's bought with BGMC funds. But we can't go find Cassie. We can't go find Mariah West, the girl that I got to hang with this past week that I found uh, last past November and got to visit her in a home. 
We can't find hundreds of others that we find unless you sin. And the only reason you reach into your pocket and you give to missions is because you see value. I just want you to see the value that God sees in people. You see the need. I want you to take it a little step forward. I want you to see the value. And so today, from me and my wife and all of our teams that travel the U.S., we thank you, River of Life, for your sacrifice and your giving. You're going to get to meet Cassie one day. I pray that you... You'll get to walk up to her or she walks up to you and says, hey, thanks for sending that goofy ball-headed guy to find me. I went through heck to get here, but I'm here. And so thank you so much. We love you guys. Yeah, you can be seated. I'm going to show you a video in 2020. Uh, he just wanted to make sure you're awake. <laughs> but in 2020, uh, we felt we, we wanted to buy a truck for Convoy of Hope. And uh, we bought a truck. We bought two trucks. And that type of giving during that Sunday was... was um, incredible it was a spirit of generosity moved to the church that encouraged convoy of hope they they call a person who called me and told me what it meant to them that we would buy not one we would our goal was one we raised enough to buy two trucks listen to what convoy has to say this morning Hey, River of Life in Cold Spring, Minnesota. Jeff Anderson standing out here in the general headquarters of Convoy of Hope in our truck yard. You guys have been a strategic partner of Convoy for so many years. Thank you, Pastor Denny and Cheryl, for your time, your influence, your love, your generosity from the church. And so I'm standing here. You guys have helped us purchase two, but you got a new mission on your hands. And the new mission is this time is to fill this space with another tractor trailer. I can't tell you guys how much we appreciate River of Life helping us deliver hope around the country and around the world. Currently feeding half a million kids in 39 countries, empowering thousands of women, girls, and boys, training so many farmers, and responding to disasters. So I just wanna say thank you on behalf of our entire team for your generosity, your love, God bless you. And that would be one of the goals for this convention as well. So let's do, let's do another truck. You know, it's, the, the need is so great. There was a quote on one of the videos we saw that just talked about the, the imbalance of wealth in the world. And because of the imbalance of the wealth in the world, those who have it aren't giving, aren't going, aren't sending. And it look, makes the job look impossible. Don't let that happen here. Studying church history from the years past, finding that churches that once were very passionate about missions have lost somehow the heart for missions, and it's affected the life of the church. There's someone who's done a study of churches that do missions conventions. They say there's a whole new different dynamic to the church that's got a heart for missions, an awareness of God's presence, a sense of life, more people coming to Christ, more water baptisms, and the list goes on and on. So that's what we want to do. So we are doing that and we're saying, listen, that's what we want to do because that's who we are. If you're here, you've only been here a short time or you're here first time today, that's what we want to do as a church is to reach out and touch those who are hurt. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. If that's what he came to do, I think the church should do the same thing. There's a story about 10 lepers who come to the Lord and they cry from a distance because they couldn't leave their leper colony. They had to stay a distance from people. They couldn't see their young grandchildren or children grow up. They couldn't go shopping. They're confined almost like a prison. You couldn't leave this. Ten of them cried out. Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest, which was, was required once you were, felt you were healed. You go to the priest, you examine, you say, yeah, you're healed. It says they went. Nine of them, ten of them went. And as they went, they realized they were healed. The word there is used. They were healed, made well. And only one came back. Only one came back. 
And there's one that probably shouldn't. He was a Samaritan. The rest were Jewish. Samaritans and Jews don't get along. And Jesus said, well, you're the only one? Didn't I bless ten? And you are the only one? And he said this, a powerful statement. Now, earlier it said they all went and were healed. And then it said again, he said, go, your faith has healed you or made you well. Two different words. One is you've been healed of leprosy. When you have leprosy, your soft skin is burnt off or eaten off, your ear lobes and your nose, your eyelids, anywhere there's soft tissue in your fingers. It's eaten off. So someone said, oh, you had leprosy at one time. Yeah, but I've been healed. My, ver my healing's been verified by the priest. But you still looked like you had leprosy, except for one. The one who says, the word there is sozo in the Greek, which means you have been made whole. You've been made complete again. You've got your skin back that was once eaten away by leprosy. And I look at what God's done for our church. Jody alludes to it when he comes here. Anyone who comes says, wow, what's happened to River of Life? And not to come to God and say, God, we are, we thank you for what you've done in our marriages. You've, you've restored our marriages. You've given our children a place they look forward to go to. You have you've healed our bodies. You've strengthened our relationships. We found employees at your church. We found an employer at your church. We have found blessing at your church. There's all kinds of things. And yes, simply to go on our way and say, well, thanks, but no thanks. God wants to do something in this place. But it comes, I believe, through a heart that's willing to sacrifice praise to him that creates within us a generous heart. We watched a movie last week called The Sound of Freedom. So we're going to ask you to give in just a moment. You have a card. If you want to grab that card, it's next to you. Pick that card up and look at that card. And on, on one side of that card, you'll see your name, your email address, and what you think you could pledge to make this happen. Can we, can we buy another truck for Jody? I said, Jody, what's your frustration? This vehicle, when it was here last time, was real. They were happy. They are tickled pink to get it. We helped buy that vehicle. And they thought, well, this is going to be more space than we need. And now with the, the need that they're facing, it's too small. They need to figure out something more. We've got to help them. We've got to continue to send them. And that card, say, here's what I want to do. Here's my sacrificial give. I want to be overcome with a spirit of generosity and give as I've never given before. And then they, there's a perforated line through that. Tear that off and then fill in the other side as well. That would just simply be something to remind you. Put it on your bedroom mirror. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on the dashboard of your car. So you'll pray for guys like Jody. The money won't change the hearts and lives of these kids who are trapped in human trafficking. It's your prayers that's going to do that. So we just don't go. We pray. We give. And we send. This is the sending part. So now you can stand. And I'm going to play this last quote. Last Sunday night. Boy, it hit me so hard. I said, wow, that is so true. Every church that has any amount of resources needs to hear this quote from this movie and be challenged by what Jody shared this morning, or challenged by what Convoy of Hope has asked of us this morning. Listen to this quote. Did you know there were over 22 million new images of child pornography on the web this past year? That's a 5,000% increase over the past five years. But meanwhile, over two million children a year are being sucked into the deepest recesses of hell. Trust me, man. If we do nothing... their pain is gonna spread and spread. So someday it's gonna reach the likes of you. And that will be a nightmare. You're never going to wake up. Trust me, man. If you do nothing, if you do nothing, their pain is going to spread and spread until it finds the likes of you. 
the last quote before you write your check, before you fill out that card, or maybe you already have. This last quote is also a powerful quote. Listen. When God tells you what to do, you cannot hesitate. When God tells you what to do, you cannot hesitate. Father, we've listened to Dustin Sunset, a challenged young man who's given up the affluence of a great country of America and gone to an area of the world where to live as an American is a risk. Father, we listened to the story of the rich young ruler who had everything and blew a great opportunity. Lord, we gathered around those who've gone on before us, and we had this great cloud of witnesses that has surrounded this church. And somewhere in our spirit, we could hear them cheering us on, encouraging us to go, and encouraging us to give. And we hear their voices. In Hebrews 12:1, last week Kirby challenged us and stirred our hearts towards mission. Today, Jody has wrecked our lives with the calling of young ladies who have been deceived into a lifestyle that is nothing more than a hell on earth. And Father, I pray that we would hear your voice. And God, if you tell us what to do, we promise you we, we will not hesitate. We will commit. We will go. And as the, the ushers are coming now, and as you give, here's a song. We'll explain to you in a couple weeks what's behind this song. Every year I get a song for my life, I get a verse for my life, and I get a goal for 2024. This is my song for 2024. As you give, listen to these words. And if you told the sun, 